Mm-hmm. Shall I go to live? <clears throat> yeah, Monal. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon uh, to one and all. And I think by this time, it may be good afternoon for Professor Jos Bendrim as well. So we welcome you again to the third session of ICT Plan 2. Okay, so uh, in this session, we have an invited speaker. Good afternoon uh, to one and all. And I think by this time, it may be good Amali, is that? Uh, wait, let me let me just. So we welcome you again to the third session of Two. Okay. So uh, in this session, we have an invited speaker. Good afternoon uh, to one and all. And I think by this time it may be good. Amali, is that? Uh, wait, let me let me just. So we welcome you again to the third session. Uh, it's not from mine. Bijan, I don't understand. <laughs> George, I think you may have the YouTube link open at the moment, so it's coming yeah, through uh, your microphone as well. I think that I have the YouTube link open. It's not, it looks like it's coming from your end. It's based on the outline, but it, I'm not certain. Oh. oh, let me check if I can uh, close it's this. It's not from mine. And now? Now it's all. Yeah. I believe that Kellen was correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kellen. Okay, anyway, you, so yeah, uh, we have an invited speaker among us in this session, uh, Professor Jos Bindrem, and he's going to give a very interesting talk to us. And along with, uh, with him, we have three more speakers in this session, and they're going to talk on the area, on the topic of morphology. So. To chair this session, I request Professor Priyanku Sharma, IIT Guwahati, India, and to kindly introduce our invited speaker and to chair the session. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Uh, it's a privilege to chair this session. And uh, this is the session which is termed as Phonology 2. We have one invited uh, talk uh, by George Fendrium, Professor George Fendrium, and then we have a few a uh, couple of papers uh, by Carlos uh, Kim uh, Swantak and her team. Uh, uh, before we go to the other talks, we'd like to uh, request Professor George Vendrian to give his talk. And I would quickly, briefly introduce Professor George Vendrian, even though he does not need any uh, introduction. Uh, he is one of the most influential uh, linguists of our times, and specifically when we talk about the languages that are spoken in the uh, the Himalayan region, uh, beginning from all the way from the west uh, western borders of South Asia up till uh, the eastern borders, all the way to the east. And uh, Professor Vendrim is a trained biologist and then trained linguist, and uh, he is a wonderful storyteller specifically about the history and the history of migration of different uh, communities in which reside in Northeast India today. Uh, he has, apart from his linguistics, of course, uh, George Fendrium has started working in interdisciplinary areas before many of us actually heard about the term interdisciplinary studies. Uh, so that's one of the most exciting things about he, his works and also, uh, in a true scholarly fashion, he has not restricted his areas only into linguistics. He has gone into other areas. For example, his one of his latest books is on actually tea. So you can see he's a man of uh, who uh, has who wears many caps and, uh, uh, as I said, a master storyteller. So without further ado, I'll invite Professor George Pendrium to give his talk. And I'm pretty sure we all will be engrossed in the story that he is going to tell us about the phonology of Tenzong K today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priyanku. I hope that everyone can see my, my uh, slide. What I want to talk about today is phonology and spelling. So spelling 
is an issue that has to do with phonology. And we've been working on this since June 2017, and we're still working on this and, and uh, hoping to conclude this in July. So uh, in, in a few weeks, I will be uh, in Sikkim again, and we will be uh, concluding this um, um, work. I, I um, will start, uh, basically phonology is about spelling but I'm going to contextualize it in both time and space. So how do I move on to the next slide? It's uh, not yet permitting me to move on to the next slide. There it goes. Okay. Um, this is the distribution of the Trans-Himalayan uh, language family geographically. And so you see that the language is spread all the way uh, to the East Coast of uh, uh, Asia, of East Asia. But actually, if we look at the linguistic diversity and the main uh, language groups, the main uh, branches of the language uh, family that you can identify as discrete linguistic subgroups, you see that they are geographically uh, located throughout the Eastern Himalaya and that the center of linguistic diversity lies very much in the Eastern Himalayan region. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but most of the linguistic groups are actually located south of the Great Himalayan Divide. And they uh, actually, most of the linguistic groups are situated in uh, uh, politically in India, uh, Nepal, and Bhutan. So uh, this is, uh, this gives you an idea of the phylogenetic diversity uh, uh, the, and the, the phylogeography of this very large uh, language family and where we would probably look for the origin. Uh, each of these dots is not a language, but a language group, a group of languages, a subgroup. These are names of uh, the major subgroups. Uh, the, the language we are looking at today, just from the point of view of spelling and phonology, is a language of the Bodish group. And what is Bodish? Uh, a Bodish can be many things. Um, the term Bodish uh, is taken from Tibet. It's spelled Banaroboda Bo or B or P, depending on your uh, dialect of Tibetan or your, your uh, Tibetic language. And it means simply Tibet. So Robert Schaefer introduced this term because he did not believe that the term Tibetan dialects, which was the traditional term, was, was um, very satisfactory because uh, of the very large linguistic diversity between one Tibetan dialect and another. We could also, and in fact, Indo-European scholars do call Swedish and English and German and Dutch Germanic dialects at their conferences, uh, but, but most people think of them as separate languages in terms of mutual intelligibility and literature, etc. So the Tibetan dialects are actually very distinct languages, and Bodish dialects is a relatively neutral term. Nicolas Tournadre proposed the term Tibetic languages, which works well in English and um, French, but it doesn't work well in Dutch or German or even Russian for that example. So, so uh, it, uh, because it means it's the same then. And then Gon and Hill actually say Tibetan languages, which is perhaps objectionable to people in Bhutan, who, where, where Bhutan has historically fought uh, more than one war against Tibet, and they don't think that their language is a Tibetan language because Tibetan is, of course, having to do with Tibet. So the, the old term Bodish languages or the traditional term is not a bad one. And uh, what are the Bodish languages? I can apparently only move forward this way. Um, we have the, the Bodish languages proper, and then you have these languages that are called East Bodish languages. Uh, what are the East Bodish languages? I'm delighted to say that there's a beautiful article coming out by Tim Bott uh, this year, which will explain to you what the phylogenetic position of the East Bodish languages is and how they are related to what we call the Bodish languages proper. But uh, it's a bit terminologically confusing when you say that uh, Bodish consists of Bodish and East Bodish. Uh, so 
I at one point pro uh, pro uh, proposed repurposing uh, the, the, the defunct higher order label that Schaefer had once coined, uh, Bodic, uh, to encompass both East Bodish and Bodish. And, and of course, East Bodish may be East Bodic, uh, but that is something that uh, uh, Tim will uh, provide all of us the answer for in the forthcoming publication, which is a historical linguistic publication of a very high caliber. This, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, you see uh, a legend to this map, and those are the historical boundaries of Tibet in, with this tan indicated in this tan line, because after the uh, invasion of Tibet by the Chinese 70 years ago, uh, they cut up uh, the country of Tibet and redrew uh, borders and created new Chinese provinces. And, uh, 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 and uh, Qinghai is just the translation of uh, Tong Nungpo, which is the blue lake here, which is a Tibetan name for this lake. But uh, the original here, if we look at Bhutan, the original area where the Tibetan kings the ancestral Tibetan kings where you find their tumuli or burial mounds is south of Lhasa and north of um, northeastern Bhutan. So this is where uh, Tibetan spread in all directions uh, from the sixth century onwards uh, by martial conquest of all of these areas. So the Tibetan dialects have spread in every direction and they have spread outside of this area even to the east. I'll show you on the next map. This is a dialect map. It's a bit confusing because the uh, because of the colors. The linguistic boundaries are blue, and the national boundaries are ochre. But here you see that Tibetan is spread all the way uh, into the northwest. Into uh, this is a dotted line because actually this is Pakistan occupied Kashmir, and so in in uh, it's it's not an international boundary. And, and in Baltistan here, uh, we have three very conservative Tibetan languages or Bodish languages that are spoken. And these Bodish proper is these dialect areas one to six, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And today we're only going to talk about three and six and mostly just about six. And seven is the East Bodish languages about which Tim is writing. Uh, an article. Um, orthography is spelling, so it is about writing and script, but it is also about phonology and morphophonology. Um, phonetics is an ancillary science, actually, that only helps you to study uh, 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 phonetic differences that, that, that some of which are phonemic, but some of which are not. A very good example here from English is in English, you have three different L's. You have, uh, if you're speaking, uh, you know, nice English like uh, Prince Charles does, then you, you, when you say clean, then after the initial occlusive, you have a, a voiceless sl, clean, and please. And if you say pill or milk, you have a very dark L, which is a very different type of L. And then in words like let or lascivious, you have a clear L. These are three allophones, regular, positionally determined allophones of one singer, single phoneme. But you only have the one single phoneme in English. But of course, in Welsh or Zonka or Denjonke, uh, uh, these first two allophones, English allophones, are separate phonemes and have phonemic status, phonological status, excuse me, the first and the third. And, and in, in certain languages, in Africa, for example, you have the, the, the dark L as a separate phoneme. So how do the phonemes relate to the script? Let's first look at the script. Some of you already know the Tibetan script, and those of you who do not know the Tibetan script, I will teach it to you now because it is not difficult. This is the entire uh, inventory of consonant symbols of the Tibet or letters, if you will, of the Tibetan script. Uh, in each cell in the upper right hand corner is the European traditional Tibetological transcription, which is, or transliteration, excuse me, which just tells you the value of the letter. Um, and this uh, transliteration system is uh, dates from the early 
uh, 19th century from the early 1800s. So this just tells you what letter is there. And then you have what we believe to be the original phonetic value below it in international phonetic uh, notation. So uh, this is the entire, and of course, if you are familiar with an index script, this looks very logical. Ka, ka, ga, na, cha, cha, ja, nya, ta, ta, da, na, ba, pa, ba, ma, tsa, tsa, za, wa. This is different than many Indic languages. Then, ja, za, ha, ya, ra, la, sha, sa. And then we have ha and a with a glottalized release, whereas this uh, 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 here is with a with a with a, a, a breathy uh, voice onset release, and this has a glottal sudden glottal release. So these are all of the letters, and these are the letters again, exactly the same letters on the left, and again on the right, but only some reordering. Uh, rearrangement so that we put the sibilants together. And then if we put wa, ya, ra, la, already this looks more uh, satisfying to an, someone from, because uh, familiar with the Indic scripts, because then uh, uh, ya, ra, la, wa are together. And then you have these different onsets, ha, ha, and ah, uh, at, at the end. So this is a li linguistic rearrangement, but if you're consulting a Tibetan, or a Bhutanese Dzongkha dictionary, you simply use the canonical order on the left. Now, if you have memorized all of these letters on the previous slide, or you happen already to be familiar with them, then most of these consonant clusters will also be absolutely transparent to you because if we look right here, this is just really piling the consonant letters that you already know on top of each other. The only additional four additional symbols are that you have a, a wazur, a, a rata, a yata. So for a, a post -con consonantal wa, ra, or ya, or you can have a, a little go chain, a little prefixed ra on top. So other than that, every all of this apparent complexity, the optical complexity on this page is, is really just uh, letters other than those four symbols. Uh, familiar letters piled on top of each other to create or to depict uh, consonant clusters. It's no more complex than that. The Tibetan script is extremely easy. For the vowels, this is a, i, u, a, o. We have four diacritics only that you have to learn, ki, ku, shakchuk, dengpo, and naro, and you can attach them, of course, to the consonants, and that is the native spelling system. And it's no more complex than that. And if you write in a very pleasant cursive script, then uh, as you do in, for example, Bhutan or Sikkim, uh, this Joey type of script, and the, 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 the script looks like this, and it's a, a very pleasant optically. Uh, but now let's look at spelling. The script was devised uh, or is imputed to uh, Tumi Sambota or Tumi Sambota, who devised this script and who lived in the seventh century. Of course, the language was spoken very differently in the seventh century. And for I just give a, a very typical example of one word, uh, but uh, 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 the, the, the whole language is full of words that are like this, where you have a word that is spelt or 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 or. Bergyad is what you spell. So this is what you actually spell. And it means eight. And this is the spelling. But if you live in Timpu today, you will say in Bhutan, you will write this, but you will say ge. And if you live in Lhasa today, you will write this and you will say che, che. And but but the spelling is complex because the spelling is historical, the spelling is old-fashioned. And there were uh, Jesuits and Dominicans who uh, went in the 17th century to uh, Lhasa and uh, said the, the spelling is so complicated, it was actually devised to make literacy only accessible to the select few and actually to, to close people out. They thought that this was uh, intentionally devised to be complex. But of course, this is not true. English and French spelling are also very old fashioned. And, uh, uh, and 
And, and so the spelling is simply reflects an older historical state. And even in English and French, it doesn't do that because all sorts of changes have taken place. But if we look at, at Tashyangtse in, in Northeastern Bhutan, you see already the pronunciation Jat is closer to the spelling. And then we know that in uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir in Baltistan, we have uh, people who, when you ask them to say the word for eight, and they count, they count Rajik, Gnis, Psum, because I've spoken with them. And then when they count, they, you get to eight and it's Borgyad. So they actually pronounce everything that is written, although they actually don't write the language at all. They, they will speak, they will use Urdu or Arabic as, because they've been converted to Islam. And so they, they use this. But the spelling has been changed and reformed. There is a spelling reform in the in the uh, 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 in the ninth century, and then there was another spelling reform in the twelfth century. So the spelling has been changed, but it is still very old. So the older spellings that you encounter in very old documents is called Daning, which is the old spelling, simply, and then Dasar is the new spelling. The the the, of course, everything is relative, so the only thing about the new spelling that you have to know is that it is not very new, since it essentially dates from the 11th century, so much of the writing is fossilized. But of course, what people were writing predominantly are liturgical texts in classical Tibetan. This is a, just to familiarize you, I'll read it. Those who secondarily adopt a technique Tradition or cultural institution often improve upon it and excel in its exploitation beyond the attainments of its original innovators. In Dutch, this is known as de wet van de remmen de voorsprong. That is the law that the very group which has managed to get ahead of other groups by virtue of an innovation is also more prone to get bogged down at a later stage by shortcomings inherent to the prototypical version of the technology, which originally gave them the edge over other groups. Meanwhile, other groups can forge on. So if we look at Sikkim, inside Sikkim, you have Lepchas and Limbus who also write in their own script, but their script is more phonologically, the, the, not the script, but the spelling is more phonologically satisfactory than the spelling of Den Jongke in Sikkim, simply because just like uh, English and French, but unlike Finnish, and Swahili, the, uh, the, the spelling is old fashioned. So let us contextualize this in, in space, what is going on linguistically in Sikkim. The Namgyal dynasty was founded in 1642 and, and uh, uh, the most famous uh, king is of course Chador Namgyal, uh, but he is the, the third hereditary king. And the last uh, a king was uh, Pelden Dundum Namgil, who is depicted here. And here we see Sikkim between Bhutan and Nepal, and of course Bangladesh in the south and India is, is all of this, and then Tibet. And now I want to put names and labels on this satellite photograph. So Sikkim now is an Indian state here, within India, which comprises this area, if you can see my pointer. But Sikkim once used to be larger than this. Uh, Sikkim encompassed this area uh, that is now part of Gampa County in Tibet and is basically the, the drainage of the Yeru Tsangpo. So this area was also under Sikkimese control. The Chumbi Valley here uh, 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 was under Sikkimese control and uh, Kalimpong was, of course, also in Darjeeling uh, uh, under Sikkimese control. Kalimpong was taken away from Sikkim by the Bhutanese, and, and they built a, 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 a zong in, in near Kalimpong, uh, uh, Damsang Zong in, in, in here, and, and just 15 kilometers outside of Kalimpong. So this became Bhutanese territory. This is the Arun River in eastern Nepal. And all of this area here, the hills, but not the Tarai, because the Tarai was uh, the kingdom of Vijayanagar, but, uh, but this area here, the hill area, were 10, uh, ten, ten Limbu kingdoms, uh, thus Limbuan, the 10 Limbu kingdoms, uh, part of it all the way reaching to Soreng, although Soreng is a Lepcha toponym, but all of this area 
uh, in the hills here were Limbu, 10 diff, uh, independent Limbu kingdoms who acknowledged Sikkimese suzerainty. So they were under Sikkimese rule. And as the Gorkha conquest proceeded, uh, there was a battle here in Chaimpur in the year 1776. And only after the Battle of Chaimpur between Sikkimese troops and Limbus and Gorkha troops, only after 1776 did uh, uh, the Gorkhalis start to incorporate this Sikkimese territory east of the Arun into Nepal. And it took them 10 years until 1786 to drive the last Sikkimese soldiers from this area. So, so this area that is Limbuan was basically under Sikkimese control until 1786. It's just to give you some historical context. Uh, the Gorkhali conquest, excuse me, the Gorkhali, Gorkhali conquest of what today is Eastern Nepal ultimately rendered the Limbus a minority in Limbuan, a process that only first began from the end of the 18th century. The Gorkhali government still had to quell armed uprisings in Eastern Kirant until 1808. And the British East India Company set up tea gardens from 1852, setting into motion demographic changes that ultimately rendered the then Jongpas in Sikkim and Lepchas in Sikkim minorities in their own native lands. But this process of moving Nepali uh, migrant workers into Sikkim and into Darjeeling and Kalipong began in the second half of the 19th century and was a stated policy of the British East India Company. So, once this area was taken, you see that the British uh, took Darjeeling and Kalimpong, Kalimpong from the Bhutanese, and they called it British Bhutan. The Gorkhalis had taken the area that is Nepal, but the areas north of what is present day Sikkim were still under Sikkimese control up to uh, 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 Tumling, the Lake Tumling. So this was still under Sikkimese control. Later, of course, this. Uh, what was left of the Kingdom of Sikkim as it was mapped in the 1960s uh, by a, a university cartography team in the United States uh, at the University of Kentucky. This is what was left of the uh, uh, Kingdom of Sikkim. So it was also very much reduced to a rump state. And the indigenous languages of Sikkim are Den Jongke, also known as the Bhutia language or Soke or Sikkimese, the Lepcha language, Rongring, and the Yaktung language, or Limbu. And these three languages uh, are supposed to be treated as three equal brothers, according to a pact that was uh, uh, sealed into law in the 17th century. And these are the three main indigenous languages of Sikkim. The Chumbi Valley, of course, was also originally under Sikkimese control, but is under Tibetan control. And it lies in between Sikkim. And here you have Lachung, this area, and the language spoken in the Chumbi Valley, which is basically a British transmogrification of Chumo. Chumo and the adjectival form becomes Chumbi. And then uh, Tomo in, in Tibetan, Tomo, this, this valley. Uh, it is like the dialect of Lachung here and a little bit intermediate between what is spoken in Lachung and Ha. But it is closer to the, 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 the form of speech spoken in Lachung. <clears throat> this is Bhutan. Here we see that all of Western Bhutan is Tsongkha speaking, and, and here is then this Chumbi Valley. So what has gone on in Bhutan? Um, they have also developed orthography, but originally the spelling was only in used for classical Tibetan. So when they wanted to set up a school system, they, 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 they chose secular schools which were not in the Lama series. Of course, Bhutan had an elaborate school system already, but it was in the Dzong for, and in the monasteries for the monks to learn all of classical Tibetan learning, some of which, much of which is religious and, and, and of course Buddhist, but much of it has to do with science, geography, and other, other topics, medicinal. All, all of this uh, learning was through classical Tibetan, but they wanted to set up secular schools and they first used Hindi as the language of instruction. Later, they uh, expanded this number to five under the next uh, uh, king during the reign of Jimmy Wangchuk. And then under the uh, reign of His Majesty Jimmy Doji Wangchuk, they expanded this to 61 secular schools and they also uh, provided Cherkey and English. Later in Bhutan, they said, 
we declare that Dzongka is the national language, but Dzongka actually was already the language of administration throughout the kingdom. So they are stating something that was already the case. However, what is Dzongka? Is Dzongka classical Tibetan or is it the language that is actually spoken in Western Bhutan? Uh, but not as a native language, perhaps in the East. Uh, it, it, but it is spoken in the Zong, in the citadels, in the centers of government. Mm, this was the confusion. So the the the, the Zongka that used to be taught was actually classical Tibetan liturgical language, uh, Chuke, until 1971. And then people said we have to teach the spoken language. Well, this. It leads to confusion in people's minds because many people in the 1960s, when they meant when they said Zonka, they actually still meant the the spoken language, uh, not the spoken language. They still meant the liturgical classical Tibetan language. So someone from Eastern Bhutan who was very good in classical Tibetan but did not speak Zonka as a native language. Uh, uh, the people would say he would be very good in Zonka because he was very good in spelling classical and reading and writing classical Tibetan. But, but then a native speaker of Zonka might say, I'm no good in Zonka because of his uh, limited command of the liturgical language. So what is now people, of course, know very well uh, uh, that Zonka is the Western Bhutanese spoken language and that it is distinct from Chuke. But in Mm, the use of, you know, in the 1960s and the 1970s, this, this usage was very distinct. 1970s was a time of change. I don't know if it was really a time of peace and love, but it was a time of change. And, 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 and uh, this was both in Sikkim and in Bhutan, this was the case. Uh, scholars in Bhutan, Lubinado and Lube Pemala, most prominently, they decided we have to change the spelling and they proposed many spelling changes to vernacularize the language or to adapt the spelling to the spoken language. And the central monk body and many people in Bhutan objected to this, got very angry with these scholars. And then, and then, uh, then of course, uh, there was a resolution and then the scholars were honored and they did not say they were going to uh, advance these spelling changes or try to actually promote them. So there were no spelling changes, but then a few were adopted, you know, incidentally anyway, but, there was this confusion, of course. You cannot change this. We cannot change the spelling of Latin now, but this, but modern Latin dialects, such as French and Italian and Romanian, we can change their spelling if we want to. But we won't be changing the spelling of, of Latin, but of the modern dialects. So, so this is the same. This is the difference in spelling that you get, because you get spelling changes. For example, the word for door is written go in Tibetan. And so it's written like this and pronounced go in low tone in Tibetan. And then ganorogosa, this is in shigatse, for example, for clothes. But in, so the word for door and the word for, you know, this, this garb, the male garb that the Bhutanese are wearing here in the picture. And in, in, in Bhutan, they changed the spelling, not of door, but they did change this spelling because they said, oh, well, an S, you know, at the end that would cause an umlaut normally uh, in, in a tatsama word that they take from classical Tibetan. And so they, they like, as it does in, in, in spoken Tibetan. And so we'll change it. And then we'll add a, a ba here to make it look more Bhutanese or something. And then they change the spelling ad hoc. And, uh, but actually the S, that used to be there causes lengthening in Zonka historically. And the fact that there is no prefixed letter or no letter here originally softens this so that you get a devoiced low register with a breathy vowel, ko. But they added a prefix. So it's actually become more confusing to, to, to change the, 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 the spelling in an ad hoc manner. This is what happened, and then this resulted in confusion. Meanwhile, in, oh, excuse me, I jumped. Um, yes, I jumped quite a, a bit, didn't I? Uh, here, this is what happens. This is what we have in Old Tibetan. We have, uh, these are variables, that's why they're capital letters. Uh, this is K, but it can also be P or T or, or another uh, unaspirated voiceless plosive, and this is an aspirated voiceless uh, uh, plosive, and this is an asp uh, a voiced plosive initial, 
uh, and this is uh, one in a cluster. And then in Tibetan, you get a high tone with the, you get a register tone cropping up because of the loose loss of voice. So voice is, is lost, and then you get low tone and high tone register. So you have ka, ka, and then you have ka with aspiration. And then where you had a cluster, this aspiration is lost, so or it does not arise. And so you have ka. So you have two types of syllable in high and low tone. In Zongka, this process only took only transpired halfway, and it is still in the halfway house between Old Tibetan and modern, say, Shigatse pronunciation of Tibetan. So you have ka, ka in high register tone, and you do have low register tone, but you have ka with this uh, breathy voice, and then you still have voicing. These are voiced, ga. So you have the historical phonology recapitulated here. And the same with the sibilance, uh, uh, with uh, Old Tibetan, and then this is what happens in, in Zonka. Uh, but uh, we won't uh, go further into that. Just as in, in, in Indic languages, and just as in here in French, and you also have this phenomenon of Tad Bhava words, words that change naturally and become uh, a French word. Here, a Latin word becomes a French word, or a word like Aushadi in Nepali becomes Okiti in Nepali, but then you borrow the word again and you get the same word again. You borrow from Latin or Nepali borrows from Sanskrit and you get Aushadi. So you'll get Okiti and Aushadi as doublets in Nepali or you'll get doublets in French and you'll get doublets in Zonka as well. So from the Zonka word and then the word that the word, the word that Zonka borrows from Tibetan. And then you get all sorts of extra confusion in the spelling and uh, we already went through this one here because go used to be written this way. Now it is written this way, but it actually would, but this new orthography suggests that the pronunciation would be similar to door and it's not. And here you have traditional spelling. And then in Bhutan, they say, let's take away this S. So they do take away the S. But the problem is that actually in the spoken language, you have a regular alternation between two vowel stems, but that is not reflected in the spelling. So what happens in Sikkim? In Sikkim, in the 1970s, uh, it becomes an Indian state because it is formally annexed by India. But what you see here on the right is a situation that actually precedes uh, any formal annexation of Sikkim, of Sikkim becoming an Indian state. Because we see the three indigenous languages, and already because the East India Company the, had set these demographic changes into motion, Nepali, which is now the state language of Sikkim, was already the majority language because of the large migrant population that the British uh, uh, colonial policy encouraged to migrate and settle in Sikkim. So Nepali is the most spoken language in Sikkim. So that is something that preceded 1975. And the 1970s was also a time of spelling change in Sikkim. This gentleman uh, wrote this dictionary and in it he introduces many new spellings. And this is the, uh, the, inter the, the, the new spellings, but these are haphazard spellings because they're not systematic in any way, uh, just as the spellings that were introduced in Bhutan. And at the same time, this gentleman introduced other spellings. So they also adapted school books and primers to these new spellings, but uh, since the spellings were not the same between the two dictionaries, and neither of the authors were consistent with the spellings within each of their respective dictionaries, this led to a lot of added complexity for language learners. So haphazard speakers, uh, haphazard spellings actually make it more difficult to learn uh, the language or the spelling of the language than to learn classical Tibetan liturgical language. So I was invited to Sikkim uh, to work with native speakers who are the people who will decide? Because I am not a stakeholder, uh, I will make no decisions. Uh, but the native speakers who are the stakeholders, we work together and they will make their own decisions. But uh, there is this 
controversy uh, long waging in Sikkim on, this is the Namgyal Institute of Tibetology, whether we call the Denjongke language a Tibetan dialect or a language. Uh, and of course, if we say Sikkimese language, Lepcha is also a Sikkimese language or maybe even the Sikkimese language. And Limbu is also a Sikkimese language. So all three of them are Sikkimese languages. But is what, what is it? And Tashi Densapa, who passed away sadly last year, uh, was heading this Namgil Institute of Tibetology. And he also uh, was very much caught up in this controversy and, and found it a very interesting topic. Uh, Den Zhongke and Zongka are sister languages, but they're not the same. They, there are real differences in phonology between each of them and also between them and Tibetan. For example, if we get Sapatapa, Payata, and we know in in, in Tibetan, this is sapatapa parata sapra, we get spra, but it becomes sapatapa payata cha in zonga cha. And here you write in, in Sikkimese, they add this cha, which is a Sikkimese phon phonological innovation, which means don't pronounce payata as, you know, the historically regular reflex cha, but pronounce it the way it is written. That's what it means. So pronounce it. Pia. So this animal is called Piaka, and here it is called Cha in, in Zongka because Pia is retained in, in Sikkim, but it becomes Cha in, in Zongka. So this type of difference is there. Um, cha, 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 this is the, the same as we see, but the, these, these uh, combinations down here in Sikkim, uh, you have the Tatsama forms, Payata Cha, Payata Cha, How Bayata Ja, and then just Bayata Ja. So you have these, and this is very much like in Zonka, which happens with the, um, with the uh, 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 borrowed forms from classical Tibetan, but the Tadbhava forms are Pya, Pya, Bya, and Bya. And here we get examples of words where we get pyaka, pya, bya, bya, and the corresponding zonka forms, cha, cham, ja, ja, because they, they are, uh, and therefore the spelling must be different. And uh, people have chosen separate orthographies, of course, in the two uh, countries. Sometimes it's a bit confusing because the choices are different, but actually what you have in the language is the same. For example, the word for you, second person singular, is written in Sikkim. This is what they have innovated. Um, the Bhutanese are more conservative and have then chosen the spelling for uh, but of course, both of them are like this word for, for dharma, uh, but which is spelled this way in both languages. But uh, this is the this is the type of, of conundrum. In <clears throat> uh, Bhutan and in Sikkim, you have the problem that certain phonemes can be spelt in so many different ways. So the sound ja in Zonka and in Sikkim can be spelt. Rajataja, Bau Rajataja, Lajataja, Hauja, Mauja, Ragata Gayataja, Hau Gayataja, Bau Ragata Gayataja, Sagata Gayataja, Bau Sagata Gayataja, or Sagata Babayataja. So these spellings, all of these traditional spellings at the bottom can correspond to one single phoneme. And as a child, you have to learn this. So in the Bhutanese press, of course, this has led to young people writing that there is people need the language to be simplified. Actually, no one really means this because you don't want the language to be simplified. They're only talking about the spelling. And uh, people talk about uh, the problem with the national language. Well, why should there be a problem with the national language? Everyone speaks it without any problem. So it, it's simply the spelling. 
and, and people are, um, are seem to avoid wanting to say this because spelling is a sensitive issue and people can get very excited about spelling. Even in, even in Germany or Holland, where when people want to change one letter in, in a word, you know, this leads to uh, severe polemics and people getting very angry. This grammar of Zonka, this is the fourth edition of the grammar of Zonka published in 2009 and freely downloadable from the website by Karma Tsiring of Gaselo and me uh, as the second author, we together uh, published this expanded fourth edition of the Grammar of Zonka. And we also talk about, uh, in, the, in the second part of the book is actually written for Bhutanese. The first part of the book is written for foreign learners of the language who want to learn Zonka. And the second part of the book is uh, different proposals on what you can do to uh, uh, simplify spelling, uh, uh, either in Roman or in, in indigenous orthography. But uh, that's another matter. So these are, this is the phonology of Zonka. This is the phonology. This, these are the phonemes. No, uh, no government can legislate this and no linguist can change it either. It's just, you can discover it, <laughs> or you can fail to discover it. These are simply the phonemes. This is the phoneme inventory. And the spelling, this is a traditional spelling for these types of sounds. So you have high and low register initials, and uh, these are those sounds. You can have certain sounds. If you look here, certain sounds, uh, voiceless sounds are naturally in low register, excuse me, high register, and voiced and devoiced sounds are naturally in high register, but certain sounds, uh, these sounds can be in either high or low register. So this syllables beginning with these two sounds can be either in high or low register. Also, you can have long and short vowels, and you can have umlauted vowels. This already, if you look at this right here, ke, 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 this, if you happen to speak Shigatse dialect of Tibetan, of central Tibetan, you say, oh my goodness, those are quite a lot of vowel phonemes you have there because uh, it, you may not have as many if you happen to come from Shigatse. But a Dzongka speaker has these distinct sounds. You also have one that is not indicated in the in the phonology at all. And these are real Dzongka words, but there's almost no way to write them. Ka and Tso. Uh, so there they are. In Sikkim, you have uh, a very similar situation. And in addition to the Namgil Institute of Te uh, uh, Tibetology, you also have this institution where uh, we also work at both institutions uh, on Sikkimese orthography, phonology, and lexicography. And we work together. And here you even see the compiler, uh, the first compiler of the dictionary was photograph I showed. And here you see young people who are working on phonology and they're very interested in linguistics and in their native language. And here we work together on um, trying to uh, assess uh, and, and we spend weeks together. It's very enjoyable also. These are things that Denjonga has that Zonga does not have, the ones on the left, voiceless nasals, and of all the possible voiceless nasals, all four possible voiceless nasals exist. And then they have voiceless uh, 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 laterals, but that is the same in Zonka. So you have also Kale and Hmyo, these, these uh, voiceless nasals. This you have in Zonka, but what do we have in, and we have tone in Zonka. And here, do we do the two registers here work the same way as in 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 uh, Denjonke as they do in um, in Zonka? Yes, they do. The only difference is that you also have these clusters: Kayatakya, 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 Gayatagya, Gaya Ragataga Gayatagya. So you have this, and you have Payatapya, Payatapya, Payatapya. These are things that you have that you don't have in Zonka. And then, of course, you have these retroflexes that are caused by uh, an added rotic. So these are differences that you don't have in Zonka. So they have to be represented in some way. So these would be the Zonka, the, the initial consonants. 
uh, the, uh, the, re the second portion of the initial consonants. And notice here, you have the high tone or high register nasals, but you also have these. You have what you do not have in Zonka. You have hna, 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 and hma, just as you do in Burmese. You have them in Sikkim. So we thought that we had everything solved. But then we got looked at the vowels. And these are the vowels that you have in Zonka. And actually, you have minimal pairs for all of these vowel distinctions. And we call them long and short vowels. But it's not just length and duration. It's the vowel quality or vowel color. It's also the uh, sort of lax and tense distinction. So they're very distinct. And then when you look at what's going on in, in, um, in, uh, in Sikkim, then actually, at the end, we become very disgruntled because it's very it's it's similar to Zonga, but it's quite different phonetically, and it's maybe even different phonologically to some extent. So what did we do? We ran away and and went to traveling through Sikkim to try to figure out the vowels in a relaxed atmosphere. But we we, we so we traveled all around and tried to figure out the vowels, and and that's very pleasant, but it's actually still very difficult, and you can. You know, this idea of uh, Denjonke being a Tibetan dialect, well, it's not. It is a Bodish language in its own right, but it is, um, it, it, the, it, it does it have as few vowel phonemes as, say, Shigatse for Tibetan? No, it, it doesn't. It, 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 it has other uh, vowel phonemes. It is a little bit more like Zonka, but this is what we're working on and what we're trying to finalize. So we have been traveling around and trying to work on the finalization of this uh, final, uh, the, the vowel inventory. And um, this is what we think, but we're not sure. This is what we think. And also it sounds different than in Bhutan and something that may be long is not even long in duration, but maybe even shorter in duration. So the names, we have to rework this and we are, and this is the project. So this is the tentative model, which looks exactly identical to Zonka, but actually phonetically it's different. And we've been working on this and we are going to continue in just a few weeks. And, uh, and uh, we, we believe that we have it solved, but we're not, uh, we're not sure. Here is Kunzang Namge already. I think he also thinks that we might have, have it solved, but we're not sure. And then also something very interesting, uh, we, we did the phonetics and I said it is a helping, you know, a, an ancillary science. Well, it is, but it's actually very exciting because if we, we, we had a group of people um, and it was a Swiss Japanese collaborative project. And here you see a Swiss flag and a Japanese flag. And then the, the names of the people here, uh, none of them, none of the four are Japanese and none of the four are Swiss. And my name is also there, or should also be there, and I'm not actually Swiss either. So anyway, but but it, uh, the the Japanese and Swiss governments generally fi generously finance the research. But if you look at what is going on, these things that Tibetologists have always suspected and known, uh, and 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 thought in their minds, you can measure it. Words like this that are high tone in, in for example, uh, uh, Zonka and Den Zonke, uh, the, the tone, the high part is actually not in the vowel because the vowel part is at the, the same register, but it's during the consonantal part of the continuant that we have the, the really high register. Nga, and then nga. So this means five, and this means, of course, I, the word for I, and here, lo, uh, you know, from, from uh, speaking and things like that, and, and lo, the word for year. So you have, you have, uh, you have the, 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 the word, you, you have the, the, the high tone actually during, as you would have thought as a Tibetologist, the, the high tone is actually, and as someone who, who speaks, I'm sure that many people have thought and felt this, that the high tone is actually the high part is because it's a, a preglottalized thing originally because of this vanishing segment. So that's interesting. And there's a lot left to do, but mostly it is the same, but you have a, a wider inventory. In you, this is Tukjeche, which is the way to say thank you in Sikkim and <coughs> in, in Denjonke, because you can also say it in Lepcha and or Limbu, and you can also say it in Nepali, Danyavan, but Tukjeche. So you can 
uh, uh, that we 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 have the uh, we know the constant inventory, we know the tonal registers, but we have to uh, 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 present a final uh, uh, analysis of the vowels. And then there are orthographic solutions to the spelling, some of which were actually shown on the slides. But uh, uh, these are things that the stakeholders themselves will decide and, and, and not what I will decide uh, because I'm also not interested in making such decisions. Uh, but, um, but, but these are things that uh, people will then be able to decide. So that's, that I managed to finish in time. And uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, George, uh, such an elaborate talk and uh, really interesting one. I'm pretty sure people will have a lot of questions. So uh, the talk is open for questions as George said. No questions? Okay, maybe a couple of questions. So how about Rongring and Yaktung? Because by the look of it, they looked a little bit different from the uh, normal yeah, Abugira kind of system. And is it doing it or it is also a very similar Abugira system? You mean this? Yes, this is the, sa the similar system. These, uh, both of these uh, 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 scripts were developed in the 18th century uh, uh, in, in the, in, in, during the reign of Chadon Namgyal. Uh, and, and so they uh, were during the reign of this uh, king at the very beginning of the uh, um, uh, uh, 18th century. And, and um, the, the, the Lepcha script is, is, I mean, it's very exciting the way the Lepcha script works. The, the Nga, for example, is at the beginning. Here, uh, often what is orthographically at the at the end is in the front, and something with that is in the beginning. Optically, is at the end, and and this is also a similar script uh, which was developed for uh, uh, Limbu and which was reformed during the 1960s. So this is similar to, but not identical to the original Limbu script because the uh, I'm writing a book about that but uh, because of the old all of the old manuscripts are in a script that is that is almost like this but but actually a little bit different and all, I'm publishing one of these old manuscripts so I, I also write about the evolution of the script but but yes so so it's very different but this is of course much older this script was devised much 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 longer ago the, these are newer scripts the, the system is, and they're of course inspired by Tibetan and Devanagari and, and uh, uh, Bengali scripts, the scripts that were close by. You can see that in the form of individual letters. And some of them are very creative and innovative uh, uh, graphic innovations. But still, I mean, like, you know, the amount of deviation from the Tibetan, Tibetan script is remarkable i mean like you know it's uh, it it has its own identity i mean both of these scripts probably have its own identity in terms of typography the arrangement must be the same as in like you know etc no no the arrangement is actually not the same for example in limbu it's not the same because uh, and that's one of the big differences between the original Limbu script and the one that is in use now in Sikkim, for example, and even in Eastern Nepal. The original Limbu script uh, really abides by Limbu phonology in the same way that the Tibetan script abided by the Tibetan phonology of the seventh century, but not no longer of modern Tibetan. But, but the Limbus script, the original Limbus script abides by Limbu phonology and therefore it really deviates from this pattern of ka, ka, ga, na. It really deviates. You have ka, ka, but no ga, ga in the original Limbus script because, because the, and, and lots of other differences. So it's really, it, it's, uh, it, it, you're right. You're absolutely right to say that it's really something different because they made a very phonologically informed and linguistically intelligent decision. Both the people behind the Lepcha script 
And the scholars behind the limbus script, it's usually attributed to one person by legend in both communities, but it, it, they're really informed, linguistically, intelligently devised scripts from the point of view of the phonology of uh, the Lepcha language and the Limbu language. So they really are different. You're right about that. Yeah, another point that I had was uh, uh, about the phonological innovations that you have uh, talked about. And then later you tried to talk about how spelling simplification or at least like more writing simplification was intended. But what we have seen across the world's languages is that whenever they try to, I mean, like, I may be wrong, that's the general idea that I had. Whenever a writing system is established to a certain degree, it is very difficult to, like, you know, tell, convince people that now you should, as you have rightly mentioned, now you should write in a different way. However, uh, what is easy is to add those diacritics here and there to give uh, some kind of, like, you know, help to the, uh, new readers and the foreign language learners to learn that. So, I mean, like people are happy to accept diacritics, uh, what you call phonological innovation uh, in many of uh, these cases. However, uh, complete change is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, your comments on it. Yes, uh, uh, yes. But here there are also two issues, uh, or maybe three. Uh, one is, one is, uh, everyone, every, everything written in Tibetan, in, in Chukka, in liturgical language, will be written the way it is. If you choose to write Denjonke in a modern orthography, you can do this in um, the native script, or you can do it in Roman, and you can choose uh, either, you know, to change a thing here or there, uh, and you will have a haphazard system, and it will make it more difficult for children to learn, or you can make a phonological system, or you can try some mixed form. Uh, but these are choices that people can make. And then romanization, what purpose does romanization serve? You could use it on your iPhone and then um, you can... Uh, you, you, can, you, you, know, you can use it in a dictionary to indicate pronunciation if you decide to retain traditional orthography. Uh, so, so you could, uh, uh, but these are choices that people uh, can make, but it's very difficult actually in practice to learn a spelling system that is like English or French. And French and English speakers make spelling mistakes that uh, uh, speakers of Finnish never make in their own language. Uh, uh, they, they just don't. They, they, it never occurs to them to make that type of mistake. Whereas uh, English and uh, uh, French speakers do it all the time and it's more difficult to learn. Uh, the, the spelling of uh, Zongha and Tibetan and then Zongke is even more complicated than learning the spelling of English and French. So if you reform the system, you can choose not to reform the system, which is a legitimate choice, or you can, and just keep it the way it is traditionally, or you can reform it, but then are you going to do it in a haphazard way? Or are you going to do it systematically and say phonologically? The advantage, and this is a, because you say diacritics are difficult. In Bhutan, we've tried this. We've introduced it and there, there, there are workshops being conducted in Bhutan by Bhutanese with the Roman Zonka that we have created and what young people who do these workshops, who are being taught by Bhutanese, and the students are also Bhutanese, they say, once we learn this, the problem is we can't go back. We cannot go back to the original spelling because we don't have to think about the spelling anymore. Even the diacritics are easy to use because we hear when we are saying nga and when we are saying nga. We hear that and we can write the apostrophe there to indicate the high tone at the beginning of nga. We can, we can do that, and uh, we hear that, but we can't go back because we can't remember whether it was a ra ngata or a dao ngata. We can't remember that, but we can remember what we know because we know how to pronounce the language. So actually the diacritics are not difficult to learn if they correspond to phonological reality that the people know without having to think about it. So, and that's the experience. They say we can't go back once we learn it. We can't go back to traditional. So that's the experience that we learn from the workshops in Bhutan. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Podham, please go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry to uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, George Vandrim, for that wonderful talk. From whatever I could gather, uh, uh, there are no uh, phonological correspondence with the script. And the script uh, that you have shown, at least some of them, from whatever I can make out, uh, are very complex. So my question is of, of a practical uh, question. How are learners coping out with such uh, complex, complex in the sense when, when there is no phonological correspondence with the, with, the, with the script that is used? So how are they reacting? What is their reaction? How are they coping up? Are they doing, oh, God, that is the sort of uh, overall question that I want to know from you. Thank you, Pao Tang. It's very nice to hear your voice. Actually, it's not that there is no correspondence. In fact, if we write simply, the correspondence is quite straightforward. Here, this is ka, and, and, and what the, they are writing in traditional script is ka, and this is ka, this is ga, and then here you have added a prefix to make it hardened, uh, what they call hardening, but actually even linguists call it hardening, but they call it hardening in actually in, in, the, in the native terminology, they call this a hardened sound and this is soft sound. So actually, if we, we see what is written here, uh, this spelling, with the exception of these devices used to harden, as it were, everything here is in indigenous script, exactly what is there in the, in, in, in say the Roman script, or there in phonological reality. So, so the, the uh, if if you use the the native script in a phonological way in a systematic phonological way then the correspondence is actually 100% uh, you know if you if you agree to the, the just these little conventions on the right uh, which you could even modify if you want to simplify further here at the bottom right hand corner but and this also this this is a uh, this is a uh, what the people have been have decided so far, uh, but this is uh, be also in keeping with traditional orthography, and and the correspondence here is, is just one to one. It's very very straightforward. So we have a richer phoneme inventory than we do, for example, uh, for consonants in e than in English, and they have a one to one representation. So their script is actually very well suited to represent their. The traditional script is, is still well suited to represent modern phonology if it were to be used that way, but it's not used in a phonological way now, but it could be. So, and of course, there's these workshops that are being conducted in Bhutan, totally independently organized by Bhutanese for Bhutanese. Uh, 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 I mean, independently of me, uh, entirely independently of me. The, these also work on this principle. Then it's, then it's actually quite straightforward. Uh, I was yeah I see there there is a perfect uh, for, uh, phonetic correspondence in the chart that you have shown but earlier some form like go you go and kind oh of, yes yes yeah, yes yeah yeah those those were the, the question that I was intrigued to know more. yes 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 yeah. that is the way the language is is written now that mm -hmm. is the way that the language is 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 written now and that mm -hmm. is the way that the whole language is 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 written so so this type of word for example the word for one is gao cha cha ki ku chi ga chik so you say chi but you write ga ga chik and and then you here you have burgyad and you say cha in tibet and and ge in 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 timpu and gangto but but this is this is uh, uh, th this is the way that the traditional spelling if you write in english enough you write O-U-G at the end, and if you write tough, you write O-U-G-H at the end, and if you say through, you write O-U-G-H at the end, and if you say thought, you also have O-U-G-H in the word, and, and then all of these O-U-G-Hs correspond to something different. Well, all of Tibetan is like that, and all, I mean, the Tibetan spelling is very much like that, and Zonka spelling, and then Zonka spelling is all like these more problematic cases in English, but then throughout the language. So the spelling system, this is precisely the problem that you, you got it. You got the problem because the traditional spelling is all like that. And the, the modern proposals that we have worked out together with native speakers uh, are, 
are all straightforward. So, so the, the native script can work like this. It can work in a straightforward way, but, but it doesn't. The spelling is very difficult to learn. To, uh, so, yeah, I got it. I got it. So how are the, the uh, younger generation coping up with the traditional spelling and uh, the traditional sort of existing spelling and with the kind of new spelling that uh, you have been working with the community? Uh, how is the overall cooperation? Well, are they, young, are they, they receiving it well? Are they receiving well, the young it well? People are, the young people are receiving it well. The, 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 but of course, this is heterogeneous because if you go to school and you learn the complex spelling of English and French, in the beginning, you get very angry as a, as a child because you say, I read the book and then I read the book. And then, and then the book is read, and then you're going to spell R-E-A-D, R-E-A-D, and then R-E-D, and the spelling is totally, and you get angry as a child. But once you learn this for English and French, and the same, once you learn it for Tibetan, you become attached to that spelling, you like it, you want to read books in that spelling, and you don't want to change it. The thing is that there are not that many books written in modern Zonka and even less books written in modern than Zonke. So you can learn the traditional spelling to read to Tibetan treatises. But if you want to read the modern spoken languages, many modern people are receptive to the change. But people who have learned the spelling arduously, of course, are less open to the change because once you've learned it, you become attached to it. I, I like French and English spelling as well, but they're absolutely monstrous. But, they're, they're, but you become attached to these spellings. So, so, um, so, so it's a complex issue and, uh, and people receive it differently. But young people who, who have difficulty with spelling, and many of them do, those people who attend the workshops get very excited and say, we can write and do write on Facebook and on text messaging to each other in Roman Zonka. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, but those are only those few people that work on the workshops. But the other people who have not done the workshops, they do text messaging to each other, not in Zonka at all, but in English. So it actually enables you to do the text messaging and the emails in Zonka much more easily, whereas the other people who have the choice to write in traditional orthography in practice, text message and email each other in English. So this is the, this is the, this is the test. This is the practice. Okay. The so, yeah, yeah. That is uh, great to know that uh, uh, the younger generation are uh, coping up well. Now, from the practical side from northeastern part of India, undoing the change. So we have also encountered such problems not related to only to Zonka and uh, uh, Reng Zonka. So in northeast India, we have such similar problem. Some, uh, so what you call Roman script that have already existed with imperfect uh, spelling system. Uh, so it's very difficult for younger linguists for us to convinced or even if we propose an easier uh, what you call easier more politically based uh, 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 what you call orthography based on roman script so that undoing the change is something uh, that uh, at least to my mind i find it uh, uh, quite difficult to uh, compromise with the elderly speaker and this uh, on the lighter note uh, yeah, it's great to know that uh, the work that you have been doing with the team is being received well. So thank you once again, Professor George Vavri, after a very, very long time. Um, I hope to meet you again and uh, hear more from you again. Thank you. Yes, yes. I look forward to meeting you again after a long time. We have more questions uh, this time. Is there anything on the chat? Or YouTube? Yes, I think just uh, a short, short question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor, uh, for that wonderful uh, presentation, as usual. I uh, really enjoyed uh, the phonology part as well as the historical uh, aspect. Uh, it's a short question on the last, uh, I think, where you talk about the uh, high register, uh, which you said is on the consonant. So does that mean that it's in the onset? Is that yes. Onset? Yes, it seems to be in the onset. Uh, so it seems to be in the onset and then during the vowel, uh, the, during the vowel, the, it goes to roughly the same pitch. Uh, it's during the continuant part. This is only for the continuants. 
only for it's not for it's not for uh, um, um, uh, uh, obstruents. So when you have an obstruent like ka and ga, then it is definitely in the vowel itself. But also, uh, uh, you would also say that in a language like denjonke or jonka, it is superfluous because they have retained voicing. And indeed, uh, news readers who are from other parts of Bhutan may not make the distinction, uh, the tonal distinction. And then people still understand uh, 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 because they are doing the voicing correctly. But what people hear is a foreign accent uh, uh, or a non-native speaker accent, not a foreign accent because these people also are Bhutanese and, and still sound Bhutanese, but, but they, they, they hear a non-native uh, Dzongka speaker accent um, uh, in, in some cases, just as you hear when someone, uh, uh, is, is, uh, a French speaker in English is not aspirating uh, PTK uh, because he does not do it in French, uh, but he does it in English, and the English speaker has no problem understanding him. But under, but here's there is something about his speech that is different. So so yes, but in these words, in in these types of words with continuant onset, then then the 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 most pronounced differences in pitch is actually during measurably during the the. Um, the continuant uh, consonantal part, which is uh, which was fun to see, and uh, and uh, and and uh, and uh, uh, more interesting, I think, for the, uh, the the pure phoneticians who were involved were less impressed than the people who knew how to read and write, because the people who can read and write know the spelling and where it ca came from. Okay. Uh, Tomoko and Shigeto are both Japanese. I thought that I saw someone else's name. Tomoko and uh, Shigeto are both actually Japanese. Yeah, Shigeto and Tomoko are there. Japanese, yes, yes, yes. I was saying, but uh, I, I was looking at Jeremy and Sungun, and uh, of course. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yeah. No more questions? Nothing yeah. on the, Monadi, we don't have anything on the chat box or on YouTube, right? Yes, yes. yes. Um, no, so far, no questions Great. coming. Yeah, actually the question that I had, I think uh, Pausan Hakik already has asked, so <laughs> it's all right. Well, thank can read all our minds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to thank uh, Professor George Fendrim for his uh, for this wonderful talk. And as uh, I said at the beginning, we are not we are not at all disappointed. We uh, enjoyed the talk uh, very much. Uh, thank you, George, uh, for agreeing to come here and deliver the talk. We learned a lot today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very much, sir. It was a wonderful presentation. Yeah, yeah, that's so nice. Those beautiful pictures are reminiscent of your <laughs> hard work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Yeah. Yes. So uh, we will, uh, because the session does not end here, we will continue with the next presentation. And the next presentation is by Mary Rupini, um, Colson Kim Sohanta. Uh, well, uh, more well known as Kim among the circle and Timothy Tripura, who are talking about from logical study of Kokborok and English from the perspective of contrastive analysis. So uh, maybe uh, Mary, 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 are you here? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, would you like to uh, try to present your screen and then uh, share yeah, your screen? Yeah. I'm trying. Okay. Malani, she has mm -hmm. access, right? Yes, yes, I have made uh, them closed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also saw Kim here, so Kim is. Uh, I see Kim. So. She has also sent the PPT to us, so if there's a problem Whoa, from her what? side, then we can share it from our side. Uh, is it? Visible, sir? 
Is my uh, slide visible? Yes. 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 Okay. Let's make it full screen. Okay. Okay. It will take some time. It's taking some time. So. Okay. Okay. Before I start, uh, a very very good evening to all the present or uh, present here in the conference. Respected chairperson Professor Priyanku Sharma sir, IIT Guwahati. Uh, organizers, co uh, my co-presenters, and my dear participants. I, I am Mary Rupini, uh, a research scholar in the Department of Linguistics and Tribal Languages, Tripura University. So today, um, I have selected a paper, I mean, uh, prepared a paper for presentation of a topic, phonological study of Baroque and English from the perspective of contrastive analysis. Yeah, uh, phonological and uh, I will give uh, emphasis or priority in the um, analysis of uh, phonemes like consonant and vowel phonemes of both the languages. This is just a preliminary study. So there might be many things missing out and uh, Another thing, since I am from a non-linguistic department, I mean background, so there may be some flaws in my presentation. So please bear with me and ignore. Yeah, Mary, uh, can you start sharing your like, you know, full screen? Can you press on that? Sorry, is, it not, is it not in full screen? Yeah, I have already made it. Uh, Monari, can you see the full screen? Um, or? It's not in full screen. Okay, maybe try one more time, please. Yeah, just click on that um, full screen um, button, that slideshow button. Okay. okay. So, no, it's not coming. <laughs> So, uh, shall we start presenting from uh, our end, Manali? Okay, um, let me just stop. start sharing and then... Okay, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, and then I will open from mine. Okay. Fine. Thank you. It's a, You have sent final PPT for conference, right? That is the one, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm almost there. Hmm. Is it coming in full screen? Uh, it's still in a half, I can say. Yeah, full, but it's not in a zoom. No, no, no problem, I can see. It's, it's not full screen? It's I not, not screen. Full screen. Oh. still not yet. It, it's actually full screen in mine. Okay. Vision, do you want to try? Uh, yeah, it is full screen already. We, it is visible actually. Yes. Oh, it's, uh, it's I think this is fine. It's still visible from our side. Yeah, it is yeah visible. for me too. It is possible. I mean, it's visible. I can go on. Oh, okay. Okay, fine then. I can help you around. Okay, then. You go side. ahead, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Okay, this is the title of my today's presentation paper. And uh, let's go to introduction. Okay, so, uh, ma'am, can you um, move to the next slide? Yeah. Introduction part. Do you want introduction? Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, I mean introduction. Oh, yeah. so it seems the slide has frozen. It's not moving. Oh, the slide is frozen. I don't know. It's with everyone or it's in my screen is frozen. It's not moving. It's not moving. Pigeon, Pigeon would you want to try from your side? Can we yeah, just... Yeah, let me. Uh, this is phonological study of Kogpuro. Okay, English. Yeah, he has, she has sent in the mail. Mail, no? Mm. Okay.
I actually did full screen and I don't know what happened. <laughs> <coughs> Did you find it, Vision? No, I I think there are two papers with uh, with her name, no? so I was a bit confused. Yeah, second one, the, the first one with the final PPT, the the PPT name is final PPT. Okay. The earlier one, previous mail. Mary Rupani, no? Yeah. Rupini. <laughs> Not Rupani. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mary Rupini. <laughs> Final PPT. Okay, just give me one minute. Okay. <laughs> How is that? Is it? Yes, yes. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's full screen from yours. Oh. Sure, this is the introduction. Uh, uh, I, I have just given brief, just uh, taking from various, um, I mean, I didn't go, uh, I didn't try to analyze in, uh, into depth. And these are just to compare between the phonemes of English and Kaupara. So here are the introduction, which I have made uh, written. So in the world today, there are uh, about uh, thousands languages spoken, but no language have the same sound structure or they may vary in the number of vowels and consonants for, uh, and, as they have. And the uses of tonal contrast or stress pattern and shape of the syllables, et cetera, also may vary. However, it is also evident that all these languages have similarities in the structure of their sound systems. So every language is, every language uses different sounds to make up their entire sound system. Some languages share many similar uh, sounds and some do not. So yeah, contrastive analysis is the system or systematic study of a pair of languages with a view to identi uh, identify their structural differences and similarities. Uh, so in order to compare the phonemes or the sounds of uh, for the language that is English and Cobra, I have just uh, uh, seen, uh, taken from the perspective of contrastive analysis. And uh, in Lado, uh, Lado's 1957, uh, he stated that uh, those elements, those elements that are similar to the Lana's native language will be simple for him. And those elements that are different will be difficult. Yeah, he um, his, uh, Saying about uh, based on the second language equation, which is, which state that uh, whenever the uh, native language and the target language uh, system, I mean elements are if they are uh, similar, then the learning for the learners become easier. Whereas if there are various uh, vast difference, then it becomes difficult for them to acquire the language. So uh, this paper attempts to compare the phonemes of in English to find out the similarities and differences of the sound system they say. Okay, if you look at into the um, ling linguistic families or background of the two languages, you can just see that Kaukbarok belongs to Borogaro, a group of tibeto burman branch of uh, Sino-Tibetan languages, whereas English belongs to West Germany, group of the Indo-European language family. So here it said we can find it. They are totally uh, uh, different from each other in their family, uh, language family. So here objective is to compare and contrast the sound systems, uh, especially consonants and vowels of Baroque and English, and to find out the similarities and differences in the sound system of the two languages. So here methodology I have collected from, I mean, I have uh, used, for, uh, for this study, for the purpose of this study, is that I have uh, consulted both primary as well as uh, second, secondary data. Uh, in case of secondary, I have uh, consulted books, and in case of primary, I consulted some linguists. 
Okay, analysis. Now let us come to the analysis of the phonemes like consonants and the uh, vowels. So here, first let us see about the consonants. Kokorok has 20 consonants and English has 24 consonants. So below, may, below uh, are given in details about the consonants of the two lengths. Okay, this is the Kokorok consonantal phonemes. Um, Kokorok has uh, 11 stops, like, uh, and it has uh, eight, eight uh, unaspirated stop and three aspirated stops. And it has uh, two fricatives and three nozzles, one lateral, one trill, and Two semi vowels, that is, wo and yo. These are semi vowels. These are the consonantal phonemes of Kaubara. And next, this is the uh, consonantal phonemes of, uh, sorry, English. Huh? Consonantal phonemes of English. So here we can find it. Um, there are six stops in English, according to this uh, data, I mean table, and three nozzles. Two, uh, two affricate <laughs> and uh, there are, uh, these are the fricative where most of the Kogborok phoneme, uh, Kogborok language <laughs> means are uh, absent and lateral one and continuant one and semi vowel bo and the two. It is similar to Kogborok. Next. Okay, now let's go to vowel system. I mean, okay, Kogorok has six vowels and it has uh, deep, uh, four deep tongues. English has 12 vowels, I mean, uh, monotongues and eight deep tongues. And it has also five deep tongues. Yeah, we can. Uh, we didn't find any trip tongues in case of Kogorok. So this phonemes will be uh, displayed or described in the chart below. I mean, next slide. So these are the Kogorok uh, vowel phonemes. Kogorok has um, two front vowels, two back, uh, two back vowels, and two central vowels. Whereas English has, uh, so that, I mean here, five front vowel, vowels and five back vowels and two central vowels. So these are the short vowels. So here, if you look at the tongues, uh, as uh, one of my co-presenters co said that there are three diphthongs in Kokoro, but uh, I have also found that uh, another, yeah, I, I discovered it is ow. Hmm. Apart from oi, ui, i, I also have the discovered ow. Ow means to agree. And, uh, okay, oi. Oi is, uh, this is uh, occurrence. It is um, given example based on their occurrence, which can or uh, which diphthong can occur initially, medial, and final. Okay. So, in my finding, there are a uh, four diphthongs in power. Next, and diphthongs. Sorry, diphthongs of English. English has eight diphthongs. And uh, it has been given here according to based on their occurrences, where which diphthong, which in which position it can occur, so it has been given. Examples have been given here. So these are the diphthongs, diphthongs of English. Um, I have found that there are five tongues and wherever you find this that means it doesn't occur 
and wherever it can occur, it is given in the words. Okay, next. So uh, after comparing or uh, analyzing those vowel uh, consonantal charts and the uh, vowel charts, uh, we have found that after, uh, I mean, in, uh, it is noticed that Cockbrook has 11 stops with eight unaspirated sounds example uh, given for, um, for both of the, the all these such and it has three aspirated sounds per th, th, and two fricatives so and th, and uh, three nozzles okay these are the findings uh, that found after the comparison of the two uh, phonemes, i mean sound system and uh, it is uh, here, Hogbrook lets the paleto alveo uh, alveolar fricative, sho and jo, and it is uh, variously replaced by alveolar fricatives, sho, and palatal stop, jo, as in what such as shine and laser. So it is also noticed that the dental fricative, the, and the. Uh, are absent in Obro and it is re replaced by th and the. For example, if you find, uh, if you see uh, the word then in English uh, will be replaced by the word the, that means and it, it can be, the there can be the chances of uh, pronoun pronouncing as then, that means D-E-N. So Pogro also lacks the uh, paleto alveolar fricatives, yeah, and yeah. so they are often, uh, often substituted by palatal stops, jo and jo. So it is also further noticed that the Pogro lacks the labiodental fricatives, fa and va, va, fa and va. So, but the, however, it is noticed that the current uh, generation uses the labiodental fricative sound for in their speech and other lit literary activities. So I hope in the future, this uh, will, will be included in the sound system also in, in, in case of power. Next. Con uh, this is continuation. This is about the vowels. So power has six vowels with two front vowels, as already said in the previous um, slides. And uh, here, this is the uh, vowels of English. And in cover of the English front uh, low unrounded vowel, A, and the mid unrounded vowel, A, ah, is absent. And also, instead of the English back low rounded vowel, A, cover has low central vowel, a. And furthermore, English vowels are categorized into short vowels uh, and long vowels. But in case of power of such categorization of vowels are absent. I mean, it is not seen, uh, yeah, as of now, it is not detected or found. So, uh, power of has four diphthongs oi, ui, i, and ow. Whereas English has eight diphthongs, yeah, yeah, qua, a, oi, oi, you, and ow. And five, five diphthongs, ia, aya, oya, ewa, and aya. Next. So this is the conclusions and implications. So from the conscious comparison of the sound system of the two languages, uh, uh, it has been discovered that most of the sounds are different and do not exist in power of such as uh, English sounds, palato alveolar fricatives, ch and j, palato alveolar affricates, ch and j, and the levodental fricatives, q and b. So in regard to vowel sounds, Pogrok has only six vowel sounds. It is a 
deification. So yeah, if you conclude, you can, if you uh, want to conclude, you can say that you can assume that there are unequal numbers of diphthongs in the two languages. Scowbrook has, uh, yeah, yeah, mistaken, I have then three. It should be four. Uh, the tongues why English is A, and it can be assumed that power of has uh, does not have a strict tongue sound. So implications I mean significant of the study. Uh, the comparison of this uh, phoneme of the both languages may be of great help and significant in the pedagogical areas. So it would also be helpful for both the language teacher and the learner, especially for the power of ESL learners to make them understand the different sounds of both the languages, uh, both uh, in uh, oral production as well as auto photograph. So these are references we, from which I have consulted. And next, thank you for all your patience. Uh, thank you very for the presentation. Uh, any questions? from any of the members in the audience. Uh, I can see- I have, Kelly. I have one. Yeah, yeah Kelly, go ahead. Um, I, have a, I have a question, and if you don't mind, just a very quick comment after. Uh, the question is, where is the Koch Baroque speaker from specifically that was included in your study? Because I know that for like for bird example, Dao, uh, Koch Baroque has undergone a lot of monophthongization of this sort of A-U-A-O vowel. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to know where they're from that they've retained this in some cases. So basically, Cobrook speakers uh, reside in, they are mostly found in Tripura. Right. And, uh, Specifically uh, this speaker, though, where are they from? Okay. Uh, Tau. Tau is, um, is a dialect of uh, Cobrook, one of the dialects of Cobrook, especially like Rupini. Mm -hmm. As it is, uh, uh, um, Cobrook, uh, Deborma has been uh, selected as a standard language for uh, Cobrook. So like uh, Rupini, Kalai, all these are the uh, dialect of, or yeah, mm. dialect of that uh, standard language for, or, I mean, the burn, or the Kogorok, I mean. <laughs> so here I have used this Tau. This is a uh, dialect of uh, Rupini. Yes. Rupini, okay. Um, and then really just quick, the comment in case this is something that you plan to put into print at some point, there's actually a bit of an argument about whether or not English actually has triphthongs. I am not an English linguist, I'm just an English speaker, but I know that this is something that's hotly debated. Um, so uh, if you're interested, I could probably send you some links about that, but just something to be aware of that that's not a popular position necessarily with people who work on English. So thank you. Okay, okay. okay. So this uh, triphthong I have discovered you from the uh, English phonetics and phonology, a practical course by Peter Roach. I've collected from okay. there. Yeah, I would as as a reviewer, I would say that's fine as long as you're citing that specific source. Then, so good. Okay, thanks thank again. You. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, uh, Kelly. Uh, any other uh, questions from the audience? No. Okay. Uh, if not, then uh, we'll close. Uh, we'll thank the speaker and then uh, go to the next up. Thanks, Mary, for your presentation. Thank you very much, sir, and to all. So uh, the next talk is by Timothy Tripura and Colson Kim Suantak. Um, so Timothy, are you here? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Would you like to share your screen and uh, let's see? Uh, sure, sure. Sure. Uh, is it visible? It is. Can you try to make it uh, full screen? I mean, like, you know, you just put on the slideshow mode, please. Yes. Okay, please. It has the same problem, probably, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, I can. So I have put it in a full yeah, screen I mode. think Gijun can. Yeah, yeah, share. yeah. Uh, you stop sharing. Let me try from my end. 
Okay. Is that okay? Yes, I have, I have stopped sharing, yes. Okay, your, Timothy, please start with your presentation. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, good evening to the organizers and uh, all the participants. Uh, my name is Timothy Tripura. Um, I'm a research scholar in the Department of Linguistics uh, in Tripura University. Uh, the title of my paper is a uh, description of Tripura sea level structure. The next, next slide. Yeah, uh, let's go into introduction first of all. Uh, here, uh, Tripura dialect, uh, which, is, which is a dialect of Kogborok, or we can say it is one of the variety of Kogborok language. Uh, so it is a Tibetu Burman language of Bodo Garu branch. And this dialect is spoken by Tripuras. Uh, Tripuras here uh, doesn't refers to all the people who belongs to Tripura. So here, what I mean Tripuras here, it refers to uh, the people who writes their surname as Tripura. So uh, some of the people also use uh, Ruaza and Chaudhuri uh, in, their, in their surname instead of Tripura as a symbol of social status. And uh, geographically, uh, the Tripuras are found to inhabit uh, in the southern part of Tripura, uh, also in the uh, district of uh, Gomati, there is uh, in Amarput, and also in Udaipur district, uh, also in North Tripura, Dolai, and Long Tri Valley as well. And uh, Tripura speakers are also uh, found in the state of Assam, uh, also in, uh, in Mamit district of uh, Mizoram. And according to Karebai, this, this is a literary magazine uh, that is uh, firstly issued on September 2020. So according to this magazine, uh, the speakers of Tripura dialect lives mainly in the state of Tripura with a population of about 2.6 lakhs and Tripura speakers numbering about 30,000 are also scattered in Haile Kandi, Karimgans, and Kachar districts of Assam state, and about 5,000 in Mamet district of Mizoram. Also, uh, more than 3.5 lakh speakers uh, are known to live in uh, different districts of neighboring country Bangladesh. So uh, the overall population of Tripuras uh, is identified to be about uh, 6.5 lakhs. So uh, this paper is basically, uh, uh, it tries to uh, describe the syllable and word structure of uh, Tripura dialect, uh, including the description of the internal syllable structure along with light and heavy sea levels, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is observed in this dialect. The next slide. So first of all, uh, I'll talk about the internal syllable structure. So, uh, According to George Yule, uh, a syllable must contain a vowel or vowel-like sound. So uh, that includes deep tongue. So uh, here uh, I have given an example of uh, the syllable structure of Tripura uh, with rhyme. So here uh, you can see the example, uh, knock, which, uh, knock, which is a house. And uh, also according to uh, Clemens and Kaiser, uh, 1983, so uh, he has uh, mentions uh, uh, syllables types such as CV, there is consonant vowel, V, uh, CVC, and VC. Uh, these are considered as basic. So among all these syllable types, uh, he also says that uh, uh, CV syllable types belongs to the grammar of all languages. And uh, he had also uh, said that the syllable type VC is the most highly marked in the sense that any language that has uh, BC syllable type also consists of CV, V, and CBC. So this also holds true for the uh, Tripura dialect. Yeah, so next page. Uh, CV syllable structure. So uh, here I have uh, given the examples of the CV syllable structure. There is uh, La. And uh, this CV structure, syllable structure in Tripura, it's a uh, uh, basically consists of uh, one consonant and one vowels. And uh, this is also one of the most uh, common structure in almost all the languages. So uh, here we can see the example, la, so that's a verb, there is take. And uh, some more examples are given below there, uh, su, wash, re, cloth, bo, to spread, 
mat and boo bit etc and uh, 2.2 so this is a v syllable structure that is a single vowel so uh, you can see an example here uh, on there is okay so there is a single uh, vowel it's a single syllabic structure so next next slide and uh, cvc syllable structure uh, tripura also has a uh, a fairly large amount of this type of uh, structure, syllable structure, CVC, uh, comparing to uh, the other structures found in this dialect. So example I have given here, uh, lung, uh, which means ring. Uh, some more examples are given below, uh, gum, which is, which is good, and uh, nak, which is trash, bull, to mix, and bur, there is numbness of tongue and uh, VC syllable structure. So this structure is very rare in Tripura dialect. Uh, I have given a few examples in the next slide. Yeah, so uh, ang here, I think it is uh, the common word uh, in almost all the Tibetan Burman language, uh, even in Boro, as far as I knew. Uh, ang, it is uh, uh, pronoun I. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, minimally syllables in Tripura dialect or can also consist of uh, only a vowel or a diphthong. So example here, a, uh, which is fish, and uh, diphthong, i, means just. And maximally, uh, syllables in Tripura dialect can consist of a complex onset of two consonants, uh, a vowel nucleus, and a single coda consonant, as in CC, VC structure. So the example I have given, shrap, there is attached. And no diphthong nucleus occur in Tripura uh, when the nucleus is preceded by two onset consonants and followed by a coda consonant. Uh, however, a diphthong nucleus can occur in open syllable type of monosyllabic words uh, when it is preceded by two onset consonants, as in CCVV structure, cli, that is do. So uh, based on the syllable structure uh, that has discussed above, so there are six syllable patterns or structures that can be found in this uh, dialect, in the in Tripura dialect. So I have given the example in the next slide. I have given you, yeah. next slide please. So these are the uh, basic syllable uh, structure that is found in this dialect uh, in the monosyllabic yeah, word. So here V, there is O, there is OK, VC, Ang, so there is I or I am, and CV, there is Su, there is Wash, and CVC, knock house, and CCV, Kri, there is naughty, and uh, CCVC, there is shrub, there is attached. So uh, maximum, uh, the onset consonant, uh, two onset consonants can take place, and, uh, and in, in the coda portions, only one consonant can take place in this dialect. So let's talk about the uh, open syllables and closed syllables. So uh, I have referred to Francis Katamba here, and uh, he says that an open syllable ends in a vowel while a closed syllable ends in a consonant. So triple dialect has both open syllable and closed syllables. Uh, there is the CV structure and CVC or VC syllable structure of triple words can be considered as open and closed syllable. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, here I have given an example of open syllables uh, here as in bo to spread map, sui, right, bu, bit, kri, there is sour, and kli, there is do. So if we look at the closed syllables, uh, we can see here sung, there is ax, rum, touch, fran, there is strength, and bell, there is soft or weak. Yeah, next slide. Uh, syllable weight. Uh, again, here I have referred to Katamba. So uh, according to him, uh, according to Katamba, Francis Katamba, uh, syllable weight comprises of two kinds of syllables. There is light and weak syllable. So here uh, in 4.1 in the light syllables, uh, he defines that a syllable is light if it contains a non-branching rhyme in which the rhyme contains a short vowel as shown below in example three. So here uh, I have given an example uh, of the light syllables. So 
o again it's okay bu bit and kri there is noti yeah, next next slide uh, heavy syllables and uh, according to him uh, a syllable is heavy if it contains a branching rhyme in which the rhyme contains either a long vowel or diphthong there is optionally followed by one or more consonants or uh, a short vowel followed by at least one consonant so here i have uh, given the examples of the heavy syllables so again kai there is to plan and ong there is to happen and uh, prung prung is morning and ball there is fire out next next slide so uh, these are the syllable and word structure in tripura dialect so uh, considering the discussion above uh, so the tripura dialect can be classified as monosyllabic disyllabic trisyllabic and quadrisyllabic and pentasyllabic so these are illustrated below with, with an examples so uh, these monosyllabic words are common in tripura dialect in which a vowel can be a syllable or morpheme or word in in, in, this, in this language or any other language. So majority of the monosyllabic words in Tripura have the uh, CV and CVC patterns. So this two structure is the uh, uh, major uh, structure found in this dialect. And uh, the other, 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 other word structure, there is a V, VC, CCV, and CCVC structure. So these are very limited. So here I have given an example again. Uh, next slide. So these are the disyllabic word. Uh, so this disyllabic word is uh, one of the uh, common types of uh, structure that is found in this dialect. So uh, here I have given an example of uh, lectured, that is hailstones. And also some of the examples are given below. Uh, there is ani, means my or mine, okra, elder, kasha, un, Toxa, small bird, wakpla, penny laser, etc. Next. So these are the closed syllables of disyllabic words. Uh, example, uh, boklong. So there is a small empty facet. And gurzeng. So there is the drown. Uh, sorry, this is a kind of tree. Uh, this is uh, a yeah, typing mistake. Gurzeng is a kind of tree and bring fang, there is a banyan tree. And uh, we can also uh, find a trisyllabic words in this dialect. Uh, however, uh, the trisyllabic words are mostly found in nouns. So most of the trisyllabic words in uh, Tripura dialect are uh, formed from nouns. So here, uh, haksirma. Haksirma means ant lion. Next slide. Uh, here are some more examples uh, I have given here. Uh, Amila, there is gooseberries. And uh, Logbona, there is lemon balm. And in the close syllables, Totobak, there is nail. And Tabotsok, there is uh, tapioca. And Young Motok, there is gypsy moth caterpillar. Yeah. Next, next slide. So these are the uh, quadrisyllabic word uh, that is found in this dialect. And these are again, uh, it is mostly formed by nouns and compound words uh, or an affixation. So uh, here, Shinzo Tokbak. So this is, Shinzo is a rat and Tokbak is a butterfly. So this is one kind of compound word. And uh, here it means bats. Next slide. Uh, here also I have given some more examples uh, of this type of structure. Uh, here, knock totobi, there is house lizard. And zeklai pabal means by any means. Mohabia means nothing. And in the close syllables, sindrai teikran, there is oriental garden lizard. And uh, again, I have given here some more examples. Sinjo tokbak, bats. Next slide. Uh, pentasyllabic words. Uh, these pentasyllabic words are very much rare 
uh, in this dialect. Uh, however, uh, it, it is formed through the process of uh, affixation. So here I have uh, given the examples of uh, this one kind of fruits that is Zhuang Pamukri. Uh, this is a mulberry. Uh, in English, uh, it means mulberry. So Zhuang Pamukri. So this is, I could find one of the uh, pentasyllabic word. Next. So in open syllables, uh, Zhuang Pamukri, that is mulberry. And again, here in the closed syllables, Jiang Ti Pao, that is true anywhere. Yeah. Next. So uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, the discussion demonstrates that the vowel is the obligatory element that is necessary for having a well-formed syllable in this dialect. And uh, minimally syllables in deeper dialect can consist of only a vowel or a diphthong, as in a fish and i just. And the maximal syllable can consist of uh, cc, vc, that is uh, two onset consonants a vowel and a uh, closing coda. So there is uh, maximum two consonants can form in the onset positions and uh, the one consonant in the coda positions. And the CV and CVC stru syllable structure are found to be the most frequent syllable types uh, in this dialect, whereas the VC and V structure is the least, least and frequent syllable structure that is observed in this dialect. Uh, the C1 slot uh, of the onset cluster can be filled by any consonants of uh, Tripura except the velar nasal N, whereas the C2 slot of the onset cluster can be filled by only the lateral, that is Ra and La. And the C3 slot or the coda position of a closed syllable can be filled by voiceless unaspirated stop, that is Pa, Ka, and nasals Ma, Na, N, and lateral La and Ra. So, Triple dialect has six monosyllabic patterns and all the six monosyllabic patterns can also constitute a syllabic unit of a disyllabic or a polysyllabic word in it. So uh, this is the end of my paper. Yeah, this is my reference. Uh, thank you all. Thanks so much. I'm pretty sure there are some questions. So it's open for questions. I just want to ask um, one or two questions that I have yes, to Timothy. Yes, um, yes, okay, before I ask that, just before your conclusion slide, you gave the open syllable and closed syllable, but then I think the example you have given for closed syllable is yes. also yes. an open syllable, right? Uh, which, okay. it, oh, sorry, this is a typing mistake again. Yeah, sorry for that. I will correct it now. Okay, it, it looks like it's the same example that you have added here. So what was the example you had in mind for the closed syllable? Um, in closed syllables. This is a pentasyllabic words like uh, one, two, three, four, five, okay. What is true anywhere in Ogbara? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, who, the one who speaks the standard Kogboro, I think, yeah, they can say it. But uh, in my dialect, I think uh, we say, yeah, Jiang Tifabu. So the thing that I want to ask is, I understand Kripura is a surname and the Burma is also a surname. And uh, is there any difference between Kripura and the, the Burma when they speak to each other? Of course, there is a difference. Uh, somehow we can observe the difference between the uh, uh, le like lexical variations or uh, phonological variations is, is also there. It's also observed. So uh, example, when I was uh, uh, in, my, in my childhood, uh, I was put in the uh, hostel for my studies and there you know, different yeah, tribes come there. So when we try to speak uh, the common language. So at that time, uh, the speaker who is from the Deborma and I, uh, who is from the uh, Tripura. So if we try to speak a Kogborok, you can say Kogborok, but 
we don't understand somehow. So example, um, uh, there is a, well, when, when I was a child, there is a mango there in the hostel. So the mango is big. And I said that the mango is big. So I want to eat. So that Thai shock, Thai shock, we said Thai shock, Thai shock godza. So they don't understand. Godza means they don't say godza too big. They say kotor. So that's how like I came to realize that there is somehow you know difference. So yeah, if we yeah. research is more, I think, yeah, I think we can find it. Okay. And uh, another thing and that example. I want to know is, yeah, please, please continue what you're saying. And example, hing, uh, the coal, uh, we say hing. Yeah, okay. I, in, in the Burma dialect or language, uh, uh, they say, uh, but it's a different, I don't remember exactly the words now, but mm -hmm. uh, in my dialect, we say hing to coal. Okay, so um, another thing that I have a question for you is, um, do these, uh, do, do the speakers call themselves Tripura or is it the name given by the others? Because if you look at the Dimasa language, you know, um, say in the Barak Valley, they are known mm. as Burmans, but they are actually speaking Hawar dialect. So do you have an endonym, exonym as such for your naming? Um, what do you I don't know much yourself? about it, yeah. Yeah, what do you call yourself in your mother tongue, your own uh, speech or your own group identity? What do you have? Because uh, Tripura is just um, a name given by the others, right? Uh, I don't think uh, it's a name, the Tripura name is given by the others, especially, I mean, the surname. So, yeah, as far as I know, I don't think that, uh, yeah, it is given by the others. Okay, I, I think you need to look at this because uh, this is very, you know, common what is happening. Uh, if, if, for example, if you if you look at uh, the Burmans in, you know, in Udalguri district, they, they, the Burman is just a surname, but they're actually speaking a coach language. And if you look at the Hills Kachari, the name, the Hills Kachari, it is no other language, but it is the Hashau dialect of Dimasa, which is the Hills Kachari. So these are all um, political names given to, uh, you know, kind of divide the community in a way. So it's just uh, beyond your uh, mm -hmm. scope from your paper, I understand, but just to look at it ethno-linguistically, uh, do you still have an ethnic name for yourself? That is what I want you to know. So maybe you can um, have a research on these and maybe you can, Bring okay, out another sure, paper on sure, this sure. later. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. I'll do that. Other question. Thank you. Emso, Emso, do you want to ask a question? No. Okay. Uh, any other? Anybody else who wants to ask a question? Very quick uh, query. Yeah. 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 Apart from the uh, the on. The B, you know, the this uh, syllable structure only vowels. Uh, do you have any other example in your language? Yes, you have already pointed out that that is not very frequently occur. Mm -hmm. uh, there is E. We say E is uh, maybe. Uh, I mean, the nearby example. Uh, if we say uh, this is my pen, so Ima. Emus again, yeah, there is an yeah suffix is there. E, e is the uh, the main uh, root word. So ema means here. I mean this is the one. So ema ira ira means here. Only the the single vowel e, right? Yeah, yeah. Only the single vowel e. Okay, okay. Is that possible? Um, I have to research on that, sir. Okay, so means it's very rare, right? Yes, it's it's very uh, rare. Bisen, I think uh, it's possible in Kongwara we can say, but I don't know in their dialect. Okay. Uh, we can say imusuk means this cow, or all 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 means for for the distant. Uh, oh, e is that uh, the demonstrative yeah, word? Yeah, demonstrative marker for uh, proximity. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Yeah, I was also personally very intrigued by the word for mulberry, which you have uh, said talked about as pentacillin. Okay. So can you just like you know, tell me what are the morphemes that are coming together and what it's what's the structure exactly? Okay, can you go to the slides? Yeah. Okay, so Zhuangpa Mukri. So uh, this Mukri is a sour. It means sour. And uh, I think Zhuangpa means uh, this is one of the you know folk tales that uh, which we have been hearing since from my childhood. So Zhuangpa, there is a story uh, uh, that a person name. This is the name of the person Zhuangpa. So since from my childhood, I have been hearing these uh, words, Zhuangpa, you know, when uh, the parents, they try to, you know, uh, make their baby sleep. So they tell the story of Zhuangpa. So I think it comes from there, as far as I know. And Mukri is sour. So obviously that Melbury is a sour. So okay. maybe because of that. Yeah, one thing, uh, Timothy, uh, I think uh, in, uh, we say, this young part, it's, um, it's like hairy caterpillar. Uh, mm -hmm. that we also say that that's young pak mukui. Uh, that is mm -hmm. hairy caterpillar fruit, some citrus fruit type. Maybe okay. it's like that in your this one because it's it's like a hairy caterpillar. So we call it hairy caterpillar fruit, something like that. Okay, okay. Sir. Yeah, because you that is how mulberry silk is basically made, right? I think uh, some, I have, I also heard some uh, Tripura speakers are saying uh, Jong Poma, Jong Poma Mukri. Maybe Jong Poma means kind of, yeah, yeah, caterpillar. Jong, it's Yong, I think. Yong is a caterpillar. So they say Jong, Jong Poma. I think it's not the exact, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, any other question? Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, we'd like to thank all the speakers here in this session. Uh, thank you so much. And then we'll meet again at 6.30. Maybe Monali might have some uh, announcement to make. Thanks to all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I think um, we. I can pass it over to Bijan to announce um, the next session. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, at the first place, I would like to thank Professor Priyanku Sharma for smoothly chairing this session on phonology too. And I also extend my thanks to Professor Jos Van Drem, who have given an insightful information, informative presentation uh, on the uh, phonology of uh, one Sikkimis language. I'm not, uh, I forgot exactly the name. Anyway, so thank you all for your you know, patience over this session. So uh, we have another invited talk at 6.30, uh, which is by the uh, Dr. Uh, Guillaume Jack. And we are not going to uh, you know, shut down our Zoom room. So Zoom room will keep on open. And I request all you to stay tuned with us. And as it is, it is scheduled on 6.30 and we are already at 5.45. So we have some half an hour, more than yeah, around 40 minutes break. So we can have our tea or some snacks and we will join again very soon. Yeah, that's from my end. And Monali, do you have any other announcement? Yeah, I just want to say that I will end the live stream now, but the Zoom will remain open. Yes, you yes. can still be here and you can move around and uh, we will meet again in um, by... By 6.15, around 6.15 or so.